Hello, I'm Gretchen Sable and I'm president of LWV ABC. We, are, uh, we serve Anoka County and the northern part of Hennepin County, Champlin, Dayton. We um, work on issues of fair voting. We work on issues that are important to the lives of people. And we are not a partisan group, meaning that we do not endorse candidates. We um, work on issues and we make sure that voting is free, fair, and, and um, done properly. It's funny how, so that's kind of who we are. Um, tonight, we're going to be talking about regenerative energy. And I'm going to toss it off to Deanne Christensen, who's going to run the, the meeting from here on. Deanne? OK. Um, representative, we're going to introduce Representative Zach Stevenson. And Zach represents our members in Coon Rapids and Champlin. Uh, tonight, he's going to speak about current energy issues in the legislature. I went on his website today, and it says currently he is chief author of House File 450202, which allows utilities to reduce, reduce demand for electricity during peak usage times and reduce costs and save energy. Another bill he has authored is encouraging a preference for electric vehicle purchases for the state. And I will turn it over to you, Zach. Well, thank you, Deanne, uh, for that introduction. And thank you, everyone, uh, for having me here today uh, to talk about uh, clean energy and the need to have clean energy here in uh, Minnesota. You know, I first got uh, involved in, in politics this time around, anyway, I decided to run for legislature because I have two little girls who are seven and five. And I was worried about the world that they were growing up in. In particular, I was worried that uh, the Minnesota that I knew and loved that was so good to me as I was growing up wouldn't be as, as good to them as it was for me. And one of the places that I'm most concerned about that relates to our changing climate. Uh, you know, Minnesota, uh, according uh, to the data, is the fastest warming state in the country. Uh, Minneapolis is among the fastest warming cities in the world evidence of our changing climate is all around us. Uh, the extreme weather events that we see, whether it's polar vortex events in the winter or massive rainfall events in the summer, uh, are have having huge effect already on Minnesota. In fact, the Department of Commerce here in Minnesota will show, tell you, show you data that shows that the amount of your homeowner's insurance premium uh, due to uh, uh, hail damage over the last decade, the increase there is just phenomenal and terrible. Uh, so, so it is already having a huge effect in our community, but it's only going to get worse. Uh, if you think about some of the things that we love about Minnesota, about makes our quality of life so great. Outdoor hockey in the winter. Our long range projections uh, for Minnesota's climate show that uh, in my children's lifetime, the average low in February will be above freezing. So outdoor hockey, forget about it. Uh, the projections show that the climate of Duluth will look more like the climate today of Granite Falls, that the great northern woods will all but disappear in Minnesota. Uh, and uh, uh, even the state bird, the loon, right, the iconic symbol of Minnesota, the Audubon Society uh, has released projections showing that within 50 years, uh, the summer range of the loon won't include Minnesota. And if you can imagine a Minnesota evening out on a lake without a loon call, it's just a heartbreaking thought. Uh, and so we need to do a lot uh, around the issue of clean energy to change the path that we're on. Um, and uh, we also need to do some things to adapt, mitigate the worst effects of our changing climate. And this has been one of the issues that I have really focused on in my time in the legislature. Uh, and uh, there's a number of bills that I've worked on, but let me just highlight a couple for you. The first one is one that's called Clean Energy First. And it's just a really simple proposition that says that as existing uh, fossil fuel energy 
resources come to their end of their useful life and retire, we should replace them with clean energy as long as it's cost effective and reliable to do so. And the great news is that it is, wind energy is already the cheapest form of new energy uh, and solar energy, uh, most experts predict will be the cheapest form of new energy within five years. And so by coincidence, it turns out that all of the fossil fuel plants we have in Minnesota are scheduled to reach the end of their useful life within the next 10 to 20 years. And so if we simply replace them with clean energy, with wind, solar, and other clean energy resources, we can transition to a clean energy economy over the next uh, decade to two decades uh, without having uh, the, to, to take down power plants earlier than their, their lifespan. But in fact, um, as it turns out, uh, a lot of utilities are proactively deciding to, to take down their power plants, uh, their coal plants in particular, because the economics just aren't there. So Excel announced that they will be 100% carbon free by 2050, 80% by 2030. They're, they're closing down their Sherco plant, their uh, Alan S. King plant, um, in, in, in a really stunning development. Uh, uh, Great River Energy, which is a, a collection of co-ops that includes, uh, for those of you in the Conexus uh, territory, uh, Great River is who supplies your power to Conexus, uh, but a whole bunch of other co-ops all across Minnesota. And their largest power plant is Coal Creek. It's a coal-fired power plant out in North Dakota. Uh, and uh, the amazing thing about Coal Creek is it sits right next door to uh, a coal mine. So they, they dig up the coal right there. They don't have to move it across the country or anything. There's no transportation cost. They just burn it right there. But uh, earlier this year, Great River announced that Coal Creek was losing money, that the cost of coal was just not economic compared to competitors uh, of wind and solar and natural gas. And uh, uh, about a month or two ago, uh, Great River actually made the announcement that within 18 months, they're going to close down Coal Creek. Uh, that's a 1,200 megawatt uh, coal-fired power plant. To put that in perspective, uh, the, the Monticello nuclear power plant uh, nearby us is, is about 600 megawatts. So that po coal power plant is about the size of two nuclear power plants. They're going to close it within 18 months, and they're going uh, to build uh, a comparable amount of wind power. They're going to replace it all with wind power. It's a tremendous uh, development uh, for for the upper Midwest in terms of uh, the transition to clean economy. So that's the Clean Energy First Bill. It talks about making sure that we are moving along from our, our fossil fuel energy to the clean energy future. Uh, and there's a number of other provisions in the bill that help us along in that, that transition. The other bill is one that Deanne uh, just mentioned, and it's about a topic that, that usually isn't as exciting to people, but it's energy conservation. Uh, you know, the interesting thing that I think most people don't realize, uh, the number one single use of energy in our society is waste. Bar none, about 50% of the energy that we produce in our society and I'm talking all of the energy, whether it's the engine in your car or a power plant uh, or a, you know, your lawn tractor, if you aggregate it all up, about half of the energy that we produce in our society is wasted in the form of heat, excess heat, or in the form of noise. You know, when you're, the noise that your car makes when it's running, your, 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 your gasoline powered engine, that's just, that's wasted energy. It's not moving the car forward. It's not accomplishing anything but making noise. Um, so 50% uh, of our energy is wasted. So one easy way for us to, uh, uh, to help the planet to <laughs> decrease the amount of our consumption is to just cut down on the amount of energy that we're wasting, okay? And for many years, Minnesota has been a leader in energy conservation. We've had a program that has required our utilities uh, to invest in uh, energy conservation measures. 
but those programs are, are all pretty old now and they needed to have uh, an uplift. And then they don't take advantage of one of the biggest sources, potential sources of energy conservation, which is called fuel switching. Uh, so, you know, if you have an, an uh, inefficient uh, uh, natural gas powered uh, water heater, uh, and you could make it way more efficient by getting an electric water heater, uh, there's no no program to assist you with that or to guide you through that uh, like there is if you want to buy a more fuel efficient natural gas water heater. You might be familiar with those programs. So the the, the bill that Deanne mentioned, uh, which we call ECO, the Energy Conservation and Optimization Act, um, is about uh, upgrading and expanding our existing energy conservation programs, which is a key way that we uh, can uh, uh, conserve energy, lower emissions, and fight climate change while saving people money at the same time. So it's a great bill. Um, Deanne also mentioned uh, the, the, the bill that I have related, one of, one of a few bills that I have related to electric vehicles. And of course, uh, we're seeing more and more electric vehicles in Minnesota and across uh, the country. Uh, they're much more efficient than um, gasoline-powered uh, vehicles. Uh, on a lifetime cost basis, they're way cheaper. Not only uh, is uh, uh, it cheaper uh, from a fuel perspective, but an electric vehicle has far fewer moving parts than a gasoline vehicle, and so you require it requires less maintenance. You know, you never have to do an oil change. Is just one minor example. Uh, so there's a lot of benefits to electric vehicles. And so we wanna try and make more electric vehicles available uh, to consumers in Minnesota so they can choose them if they want. No one's gonna force anyone to get an electric vehicle if they don't want one. But uh, if you want one, you should be able to get one and we wanna try and, and help along with that. So, and that's increasingly important from a climate perspective. You know, In Minnesota right now about, our emissions are about a third, a third, a third. One third of our emissions come from the utility sector, and that's dropping fast as we see those natural gas and, and coal plants retired. One third comes from the transportation sector, one third comes from the agriculture uh, sector. And so we, you know, I always say that though it's a third, a third, a third, it feels like at the legislature about 75 to 80 percent of our policy solutions focus on the utility sector, you know, 10 to 15 percent on the transportation sector, and the rest gets the remaining five percent. So we need to be more focused on the policy solutions for transportation and uh, for ag if we're gonna make any uh, headway uh, on this issue. So maybe that's the 40,000 foot overview of some of the stuff that I've been involved with and the macro picture of what uh, has been happening uh, with climate here in, and clean energy here in Minnesota at the legislature. Um, I'm very, very happy to answer questions all night about this issue. People who know me know that I can talk about it. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Um, Zach, uh, I understand some of these bills. I read about them. Are you getting pushback on these bills? I see none of them passed in the current legislature, and where's the pushback coming from? Yeah, so there, there, well, if I can quibble with you a little bit, many of these bills okay. passed the House. <laughs> right. They did not become law uh, because the, the Minnesota Senate uh, did not act upon them. And there is, um, you know, there's a lot of vested interest uh, uh, in the our existing energy structures. So, you know, for example, that that energy conservation bill that I mentioned uh, that opens the door to more fuel switching has generated a lot of pushback from the propane industry, which might not seem like a big deal to those of us here in, in suburban Minnesota, but if you live in greater Minnesota, you know of the, of the great uh, power that, uh, and uh, you know, the amount that of, of homes that rely on propane uh, for heating. 
Uh, and uh, so the, the propane industry has been very re uh, resistant. And it's actually kind of a perplexing thing because the argument that propane makes is that propane is cheaper than electricity and cleaner than our existing electricity, uh, which still obviously is, comes a lot from natural gas and coal. Uh, and uh, the point we make always is that this energy conservation bill uh, only allows fuel switching if it's cheaper and cleaner. So if propane industry is correct that, uh, uh, that propane is cheaper and cleaner, then a fuel switch won't be allowed. That's maybe a tangent. Uh, and I will say we're going back into special session uh, in uh, uh, less than a week on Friday. And I, th I think that bill in particular uh, has a real chance uh, at special session. We came very close to passing mm -hmm. it on the last day of session. It kind of ran out of time. So I'm still hopeful that, that some of the stuff will happen. But there's definitely, um, uh, you know, some, some vested interests in the, in the status quo that are reluctant to see change uh, of these issues because people are, are set in their ways or they're making money off of the current system. It is definitely uh, an obstacle that we have to overcome. Okay. Do you want me to answer the questions that are in the chat? Or I, I, I see uh, uh, someone says that Kay, my good friend Kay McCauley had a question. Uh, I don't know if we want to unmute Kay and let her ask her question first. I just, I just unmuted me. Did it work? It did. <laughs> okay. Well, I have to think about when you're talking about the amount of pollution and all the different kinds of ways you look at these fuels, then there's usually something in the discussion about what it takes to manufacture the big generators on the windmills and similar kinds of things like that. And the use of those kinds of materials that are difficult to get to in the earth. And so please just kind of comment about that piece of the topic. Of course, yes. When you are talking about um, uh, these uh, different sources of energy and comparing them, uh, you have to use what's called the life cycle measure, right? So once you get the windmill up and running, um, it, it obviously does not admit much carbon or any carbon uh, or other greenhouse gas at all. But as you point out, K, in manufacturing the windmill, uh, carbon is expended, is admitted, right? And uh, solar panels uh, have many precious metals in them that have to be mined. Um, and uh, hydroelectricity, uh, even that creates carbon because usually when you, you, you dam a river and it floods an area behind the dam, uh, usually there's vegetation where the, where you're flooding, and as that decomposes under the water, it emits methane and other greenhouse gases which bubble up and get into the air. So even hydroelectricity uh, can generate uh, greenhouse gases. Uh, so the thing that we do is we compare life cycle uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So looking at the windmill from when it's, you know, the material is mined and, and made into, a, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the blades are not usually steel, they're fiberglass, but the, the um, you know, well, I don't know why I'm losing that word. But anyway, there are pieces of it that are steel. And then of course you have to make the, 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 the turbine and everything else. That has, you, you need to measure all of those uh, gas emissions. And when you do that, you're still, I mean, eons ahead of coal or natural gas. Um, emissions, um, not to mention the ongoing costs of service and maintenance and everything else and, and, and all of, uh, of that. Um, Zach? Yes? That, that you didn't really, you barely mentioned the part about uh, like precious metals and those things. And sure. Where, where did they come from as opposed to thinking primarily of the carbon piece of it? Yes, I'm happy to talk more about that. So um, there are precious metals involved, particularly uh, in uh, solar panels. Um, 
when, when, when we say precious metals, that's a, a big term for a lot of different types of metals. The most significant metal that I think is involved in solar panels is copper, um, which I guess isn't a precious metal, but it gets kind of looped in with it. And it's an issue that raises a lot of eyebrows here in Minnesota, of course, because of the proposed mining projects uh, up north, the PolyMet project uh, and the Twin Metals project, the Twin Metals project being particularly controversial because it's inside the Boundary Waters uh, watershed. And of course, these are major concerns about how these things uh, are mined. I, you know, um, these metals, copper, nickel, and other precious metals are a huge part of our 21st century economy. You know, a significant sort, you know, when your, your, your uh, smartphone, as an example, is full of all sorts of different uh, precious metals. Uh, and there's a, a, a sincere debate about whether those minerals can be mined uh, safely uh, without any, uh, without unacceptable levels of environmental damage, and also where that mining uh, can and should occur. I will admit to you, Kay, that I'm, I'm not a huge expert on you know, the, the exact science about the controls that are at play uh, with, with mining, particularly when you get outside of the United States. I know a little bit about what they're talking about doing at PolyMet. I know less about what they have proposed to do at Twin Metals. That project is far, is not nearly as far along in the in the process, so I don't know as much about what what they would do there for controls. But you know, right now, most of these metals do not come from the United States. Uh, some come from Canada, but the mo most come from overseas and in you know China or Africa or other places where environmental controls are far reduced. So I think it is. Well, I think that some of those, you're talking about Africa and all that, it also is what kind of labor does it take to do that? How many people are being exploited for us to have all these wonderful things? And I, I'm not going to ask you to go way into that. I would just like to have it as part of the things that we are supposed to look at and how we treat other people in the world. Those are fair considerations. And of course, the people who are advocating for projects like PolyMet and Twin Metals will say that if we're going to enjoy these um, devices uh, here in Minnesota, uh, we should be doing the mining here uh, as well and, and doing the environmental conservation and uh, labor protections that go along with it. Now, of course, there's counter arguments to those as well involving the unique nature, for example, of the boundary waters and the risk of doing irreparable harm to an irreplaceable resource. Uh, and I'm not, really, I, did, I don't want to have the rest of the discussion be about this topic because I know other people have questions too, so. It's a tough question. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Dan, do you want me to just answer questions from the chat or do you want to read them off or, or do you want the people to read them off? This is your show, you tell me what you'd like. Uh, answered them from the chat because okay. they've been. The first question I see, uh, here is uh, from Jerry Nelson, and it says, uh, what are the top things that egg could do to cut energy use? And that's a great question. As I mentioned, you know, um, we, uh, uh, it's about a third of Minnesota's emissions come from the agriculture sector. And it would be even higher, but we lump in forestry in with egg. And forestry is a, what we call a carbon sink. It, uh, you know, trees, uh, you know, they, consume carbon and store carbon in their in their trunks and branches. And so uh, the inclusion of the forestry sector in the agricultural sector actually makes it seem like ag is producing less emissions than they are. Uh, there's a few different uh, uh, things that we can do. Uh, one major source of agriculture emissions is uh, uh, methane uh, and other uh, noxious gases that come from livestock production. And I don't want to be crude, but when you're talking about uh, you know what comes out of a cow's uh, rear end, uh, it, it turns out there's a, a lot of a lot of gas, uh, and that in aggregate is having a climate impact. But what we can do uh, is uh, uh, and there's a, a whole uh, exercise now around what's called uh, renewable natural gas or biofuels. 
So what they do is they collect all of that material and they put it in what's called an anaerobic digester, uh, which is essentially a large concrete and other big device. And it collects all of the, the, the uh, gases uh, and they can be uh, processed and turned essentially into something that is, uh, uh, can be used interchangeably with natural gas. And that's really appealing uh, for use. There are some sectors of our industrial economy that are very hard to electrify. Uh, think um, uh, concrete manufacturing or uh, uh, the uh, tan taconite uh, uh, operations up north or steel. Uh, and so the, one potential thing uh, that, that you can do is, is harness all of that um, dairy manure, uh, turn it into natural gas, and then use it uh, for hard to decarbonize uh, sectors. And I actually have a bill that works on that process, as exciting as it is. Uh, and that as a side benefit of being a potential economic source uh, of income for farmers in greater Minnesota. Uh, we can also use uh, uh, crop um, rotation. Uh, uh, methods that reduce the need for fertilizers uh, and pesticides, which also contribute uh, to greenhouse gases. Uh, and they have the side benefit of being cheaper and more efficient. Uh, and so I know the University of Minnesota uh, is working uh, uh, very hard to encourage those practices in part through a pro uh, program called Forever Green. And then of course, increasing, as I mentioned, our forestry industry is, is another uh, a, a great option. Uh, the next question uh, from Gretchen is post pandemic stimulus bills may come forward. It will be important to make sure that we don't use this money to support fossil fuel industries. And of course, I agree with you wholeheartedly, um, particularly, you know, here in Minnesota, where uh, we have a very limited uh, fossil fuel industry. Of course, we don't, manu we don't have any oil in the ground or natural gas or coal. Uh, so I, I agree that our funds are better used elsewhere. We do have uh, rich wind resources. We could easily be an electricity exporter. We're not, we're an importer here in Minnesota, but we could be an exporter if we really harness the power of our, our wind resources in Southwestern Minnesota. What will, uh, Joan Molinar asks, what will the corn industry say because of the E85 uh, issues? Uh, and you know, the, the interesting thing is um, uh, these biofuels like E85 or the renewable natural gas that I mentioned earlier, it's not that they don't have a place in, our, in, a, in a fossil fuel free energy economy because there are some processes that are just not realistic uh, for electrification. Uh, and so uh, there are ways that uh, we can still make use of E85 Although, you know, certainly any industry that has a vested stake in the status quo is, can be uh, resistant um, to, uh, uh, to, to the types of changes. Uh, Joan also asks, what about uh, the life of natural gas, which eventually will run out in the not too distant uh, future? And of course, anytime we're looking at the life cycle of, of any, um, um, of our energy resources, we should be looking at the complete life cycle of, of the product. And natural gas has a number of uh, points where it causes uh, pollution, not, you know, at combustion when it's burned in your furnace or in your stove uh, or in your hot water heater is one. Uh, but there's also pollution involved in the extraction from the ground and from the processing into a form that it can be used in your in your home and those have to be uh, calculated. Um, it's also true that uh, we are increasingly learning more about what uh, burning natural gas in a stove uh, does uh, to your indoor air quality uh, or burning it in your furnace does to your indoor air quality and having uh, some concerns about that from a, a health uh, perspective. Um, now, if anyone who's a, a cook, uh, as I sometimes am, you know, it's, it's hard for us to imagine having to transition away from a, a gas burner to an electric burner, but they are, they are getting better. Uh, that's true. Um, uh, Sandra asks, what is being done to make the use of electric cars more practical? 
Well, you know, the thing is, uh, electric cars for most people, especially if you're a two-car two household, electric cars are already exceptionally practical. So, um, you know, even the cars with more limited range, like, uh, you know, I, I own a Nissan Leaf and it has a, about a hundred mile range. And I drive a lot, you know, going to the Capitol, going to meet constituents on a daily basis, I'm all over the place. And boy, I've had that car for a year now and I could count on one hand the amount of times I've even come close to expanding the range and a hundred miles or like driving around town is a lot. And you, you know, uh, for people who don't own electric cars, I think a lot of times they think, well, boy, there are, I don't see any charging stations. Out there. I'd be really worried that I wouldn't be able to access a charging station. But you got to think about uh, the fact that there's um, uh, a really important charging station. The one you'll use the most is your house, right? You're going to plug it in at night. Uh, and so for most people, I've never, uh, and that's not true one time. I don't own the car for a year. I drive it every day and I plugged it in. Um, either, you know, if you set aside my home and, and, and the parking garage where I park at work, uh, I plugged in outside that one time uh, at a Hy-Vee parking lot where I needed a little boost because I had been driving particularly long. Um, and that's with a LEAF with a hundred mile range. Most of the newer all electric cars have much higher ranges, 200, 300 miles. The thing that they're still you know, I don't want to say impractical, but there are challenges are for long distance travel. You know, so my my parents uh, have a cabin up north and uh, they have a, a newer leaf, uh, which has, I think, a 200 mile range. And so they can't get all the way up to their cabin on, on one charge. And so uh, they have to stop at a charging station in Hinkley, uh, a supercharging station, and they, they you know, have a sandwich and a beer. Uh, and 20 minutes later, they're on their way because these supercharging stations go on deep. We certainly need to increase um, the amount of charging uh, infrastructure for that long distance travel. But just, just keep in mind, that if you're gonna own a car, you're gonna charge it at home almost all the time. So you already have all the charging infrastructure you need. What we really need in Minnesota is more electric cars available at the dealership. Uh, because right now it's really hard to find an electric car uh, if you wanna buy one. Uh, and so that's the really important thing to do is increase our options. There's a lot of people out there who would buy an electric car, but they never see them around, they never see them on the lot, they don't know where to get them. So we need to make it more of an option for people. Um, and then the other thing I really wanna do is get more electric uh, buses on the roads. You know, there's a real opportunity for savings there, uh, both our Metro Transit buses, but also our school buses. It'd be really nice if our kids weren't breathing in diesel fumes uh, any, anymore. And I just feel like, if we had more electric buses out there, then people would see, boy, if that thing uh, can move, you know, 70 kids uh, on a freezing January morning, it probably can take me to work every day. Uh, and so I think that that's another uh, piece of uh, the puzzle. And I think that is the end of the questions I see here. And I also saw uh, a note here saying we should wrap up the questions to me at about 7.15 and it's 7.16. So that's, that worked out uh, pretty uh, there, I think. Uh, so I don't know if, if, if I'm, I'm happy, I, like I said, I could talk all night about this subject. So if, I, if anyone has any other questions, feel free to give me a call, shoot me an email. But thank you so much for having me uh, here tonight and caring about this really important issue. Uh, nothing like following Zach Stevenson with a presentation that's right up his alley. Right. I'm uh, the chair of Coon Rapids Regenerative Task Force. Can everyone hear me, by the way? I don't hear anyone saying anything. They're all muted. Okay. <laughs> Moving right along. Moving right along, our purpose is to accelerate regenerative energy solutions through education and action in Coon Rapids. Okay, that's the first slide. Second one, Dee. Uh -huh. So beginning last October. Well, no, here's the second one. We. The so member. Beginning last October, we formed the task force and the October uh, members were Steve Wells, Coon Rapids Council member, Kathy Tinglestead, former legislator, Deanne Christensen, League of Women Voters member, Taryn Stanger, Anoka Ramsey Sustainable Club president, Rebecca Holmland, Coon Rapids Sustainability, Sustainability Commission, and Jerry, Senator Jerry Newton and myself. We, uh, we spent the first two or three meetings talking about what type of solar 
energy issues we wanted to uh, address. We talked about uh, electric car plug-ins. We talked about Coon Rapids City fleet electric vehicles. We talked about hydroelectricity at the Coon Rapids Dam, which is not dead yet. Uh, and then we finally settled on solar energy uh, gardens. The first thing we found out is Coon Rapids does not allow solar gardens in the city and uh, only allow them on small rooftop installations. We have not been able to meet in a workshop with the council to discuss these changes because of, of course, the COVID-19 uh, has stopped almost everything in its tracks. So we're, we're moving ahead with other issues and just keeping the uh, ordinance uh, at bay for the uh, current time. What we were successful in doing, however, is asking the county board to, re to allow PACE into the county. PACE is a program where an, a, a business can get upfront costs in putting solar on their buildings and then pay through it for it through their uh, uh, property taxes. So getting back to the solar garden sites, we have three of them that are potentials. The first one is the WCCO tower site. The owners of WCCO are interested, but so far have not committed. Excel Energy is willing. In fact, they must buy the energy that this uh, produces. Half of the energy in this field, which is 17 acres, by the way, would belong to WCCO. And the other half to resident subscribers, subscribers who want to use green energy. And we can get into that later if you wish. One of the next uh, federal uh, issues was the federal cartridge land, as you remember it, across from uh, uh, North or uh, Riverdale, uh, across the R Riverdale or Round Lake Boulevard. Right now, it's full of ammunition huts. But all of that land it actually is in Coon Rapids. So we've had some contact with the owners of the, it's called now, it's called Vista Outdoor, not federal cartridge. So we've had some contact with the owners and we've also talked with electric, Anoka Electric Energy Utility. However, currently no one will agree that they, that they serve that land. And so we're not sure uh, who the uh, uh, electric subscriber would be for that land, but we will figure that out. The third issue was the Anoka Ramsey Community College. And some of you know that they looked at solar some years ago and decided against it. Uh, but we have pushed the item a little more so, and I know that Jerry Newton met with the president and the facilities manager, and they're interested in a program called PPA, Power Purchase Agreement. When, uh, let me see, I need to make sure I get this right. A private developer would supply the system and build a college the electricity used. And most of the time that would be, or all of the time would be, that would be lower than the current electric cost. A complicated system that they have not agreed to do yet. Through this time that we've been working on the task force, we've also worked with a uh, solar developer called Cedar Creek Energy. Annie Hendrickson, one of their folks, is on the Coon Rapids Sustainability, uh, Sustainability Commission. And Rick, Dale, Rick Tisdale is also. They have the ability to literally find private developers, private investors in solar so that upfront costs are taken care of and people pay the, up, the private developer the uh, cost of the system. But as you can about imagine, almost all of our work has come to a screeching halt because of the COVID ID. So we've had some success and we've had a lot of, well, let's wait and see. Questions? Yeah. Um. You have a question. You're you're muted, D. D, if you have a question, you're muted. Okay. Am I okay now? Are you hearing? I can hear me you. Now? Okay. The issue about um, so no solar gardens in Coon Rapids hit hits me personally because I belong to an association You're gone again. in Rapids and they do not allow in general 
uh, solar installations on their roof. So the only option I would have would be a solar garden. You, if you question? were in Excel territory, you'd be able to use any garden that we put in the, in the WCCO location. You are in Conexus, and certainly, currently, they do not have, as I understand it, they do not have a subscriber installation for you to use. Anything else? Okay, are there any if, other if questions? Energy, um, plant closing, won't there be more solar available from Conexus? I certainly think so, Paul. And need it I be in, in uh, I know that they're building one. Is it in North North Branch? They're, they're building a big uh, field, I think, in North no. Branch. And whether they will make that available to subscribers no, is something I don't know. No, they are. It's it's St. Francis that they're considering uh, opening this up. But okay. I have talked to Conexus Energy board member Ken Ferrick, and I said what can you not he said that he said the closest wind power we are could be connected to is at Faribault. so that However, is we're talking problem. solar not wind no i'm talking wind oh yeah, we, yeah. we're talking okay. solar i'm talking wind <laughs> go right ahead i did <laughs> anything else it's a very complicated system. You have, you have two entities. You have to have, or at least, you have to have approval of the owner of the land. You have to have approval of the electric utility that services that land in order for this, this to work. Then, of course, you have to have the correct ordinance in place. Uh, Ramsey has the ordinance. Brooklyn Park has the ordinance. Blaine has the ordinance. Seems like there was one more. Anyway, this is not new and Coon Rapids shouldn't look at it as being out front because there, uh, there are a lot of other cities that are going exactly this direction. And so, you know, according to the stuff that uh, what Zach was talking about, this makes perfect sense for us to do this, but uh, the, uh, the shutdown has been, uh, has been just uh, fierce for all of us. Lonnie, I had a question yes? about, about solar gardens in general, not just in Coon Rapids but we pass a lot of them on our way to Osceola, Wisconsin, where our son lives. And I'm always wondering what that does to the capacity of the earth underneath to make plant life. And I wondered if there's the potential for prairie planting, as I think of our pollinator emphasis in the league, is there a way of mixing those two concepts productively? How did you get there so fast, Linda? <laughs> That's exactly what we're thinking of for both all, all of the installations we're talking about. It's a oh. perfect opportunity for that. Perfect. Bonnie, I had a question about, I, I'm not understanding why the city is objecting to solar and why an Oka Ramsey is resistant. So what are their, what's the rationale to be Let's resistant? Take an Let's take Anoka Ramsey first. It was going to cost them a lot of money to get involved. And so for that one reason, at least, they decided not to do it. However, this new program is designed for the public, uh, like schools, colleges, where they don't have to pay upfront costs. They can have a private developer come in, put the installation in, and then pay the private developer. Only public institutions have that available to them. Now, why is the city opposed to, sol to solar gardens? We don't know that yet. We have just asked the question and they have not had a workshop that we've been able to attend and, and press our case. I'm hopeful, Pat, that we can make this happen. I have a question about cost of solar. Yes, uh, cur Currently, most of the solar panels are being produced in China and given the political situation, I would expect the cost to go up. Is that just fantasy on my part or does that reflect reality? I hope it's fantasy, Paul. Actually, from what I'm hearing, the cost of solar is going down. Now, whether that means current political positions or are there plants in, in the United States that are starting up, I don't know that. 
That's a very good observation. I, I know that my part of the program has ended, but I, I know the answer to this question. So oh, Paul, I, go ahead, Zach. I can jump in. So the, the cost of solar uh, is, is decreasing very quickly. It's, uh, it, it averages out to a little over a, a percent uh, a month uh, it, a decline. And a lot of that has to do with economies of scale. Uh, and uh, the, I think that your question about whether, uh, you know, the political tensions uh, with China will increase the cost is a good one. So far, we haven't seen a serious effect. The one thing that I will note is that uh, the one solar manufacturing facility that exists in the United States uh, is in Minnesota. Uh, it's in Mountain Iron, uh, Minnesota, up on the Iron Range, and uh, a company called Helene uh, operates that uh, uh, facility, and they are looking to do a massive expansion uh, right now. I think it would more than double the size of their facility, and that would be right in our backyard. Zach, while you're still on, uh, did I say anything else that misled our group? No. I, 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 uh, I was prepared to jump in on the pollinator thing, but yet that was, uh, that was uh, exactly right. I got there. Very good. I've had honey uh, that was made from the, they call it solar honey, Conexus gathers from oh. hives that they have next to their solar up in uh, uh, Ramsey. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was, uh, it was delicious. Any other questions? Otherwise, we are going to turn this back to Gretchen. Do you have some final comments? I do. Um, so I want to thank everybody for their time tonight and for the presentations and for being here in a good discussion. Um, what we did with pollinators, if you guys think back a few years, we got all excited about pollinators and the problems with the um, bees and the butterflies and we wanted to do things. And what we found was that our city ordinances were sometimes in the way of having more pollinator plantings. And so we actually took our, the members of our league and we kind of um, told people to go back to their cities and look at their ordinances and talk to the people in their cities and see what's in the way of people doing the right thing with pollinators and then making changes. And so what we'd like to do with this topic is to do a similar thing where we have people in the cities that we represent to sit down with their city building people or whoever it is that the planning people and talk to them. Are there ordinances that say, like I live in Andover and in Andover we can only put solar on our rooftops and we cannot have solar gardens. And so that would mean that all those big parking lots that we have there along Bunker, we could not put solar on those because that's a, a ground mounted installation but why not have solar at the Walmart parking lot or the Target parking lot? And so it's that kind of thing that I think that we need to be able to think more creatively about. But it's gonna take somebody kind of digging into each city and talking to the city and finding out why they have that ordinance, um, if there's interest in changing it. And then we can work on those things. And we can also work on identifying sites and finding other people that might be interested in taking part in the project that Lonnie, the, um, the money that Lonnie talked about and that kind of thing. So there's a lot of opportunity for us if we're able to pave the way in our cities to begin to make those changes. And with the changes that we're seeing coming at Conexus as the utilities shift over, um, there's gonna be a lot more ability to make the changes. And um, you know, Zach was talking about the need to change out your appliances and things. That's a very good way that you can reduce your carbon footprint too. Um, and so if you could put solar on your house and get an electric furnace instead of a gas furnace and an electric water heater, you would be that much better off environmentally. So that's the kind of things that we wanna make sure are not antithetical to ordinances. So anyhow, so we're gonna talk about that on July 13th. And um, so come back on July 13th and we'll try to get things organized to have more kind of discussions like that. So um, thank you for QCTV for filming this. And thank you all for being here and we'll say adios.